Whoever said the best way to learn a business is by starting at the bottom could have had my guest in mind. He started in banking as a part-time teller and part-time janitor. That was in 1964. Ten years later, he was the youngest bank president in Urbana-Champaign. Along the way, he found time to raise a family and earn a Ph.D. in finance from the University of Illinois. He's seen a lot of change over the last 50 years and since 1975 has been giving annual seminars on the state of the local economy. We'll talk about how his business has changed and get his thoughts on what central Illinois might look like in the years ahead. I'm very pleased to welcome to Illinois Pioneers the vice chairman of Busey Bank, Ed Charlo. Well, thanks very much. Well, thank you. I'm really glad to be with you today. Well, I'm intrigued by the trajectory of your career uh, because, and I don't know if I make too much of this, but you literally went from sweeping the floors to being the president of the bank. There were a few steps in between, but essentially you did that. Well, actually, <clears throat> I filled in for the janitors at night because I needed to make extra money. So I made a dollar and a quarter an hour as a teller during the day when I was working part-time, mm. and $2 an hour to be a janitor at night. So it, You pay the janitors more than you pay the tellers. So I got more as a janitor than as a teller. Uh, and this was when you were uh, an undergraduate at the U of I studying finance. Right, I actually started there second semester of my sophomore year. Yeah. When you were uh, growing up in uh, Danville, you grew up in Danville, Right. what was it like then? Well, Danville was a very booming town. Manufacturing was very strong. General Motors had a central foundry plant there that employed, I think, 3,000 people. And Danville was a very, very strong community back then. Mm -hmm. Champaign-Urbana was strong also with the University of Illinois and then Kraft coming in and other places. So we've, we've seen a lot of changes over the years. Well, and that's something that I, that I certainly want to talk about. Um, I guess it, the, the economy of East Central Illinois is a pretty interesting mix where we have the main land use being agriculture and a lot of the value is in land and what it produces. And then you have though cities, eight cities, with a population of more than 30,000 and in a region where you have counties where the entire population isn't even half that much. And then in the cities, you know, very much it's about education, it's about healthcare delivery. How do you make sense of a region where the economy is that diverse? You know, it's sort of interesting. Um, we have a bank up in the Gibson City area. Mm -hmm. And that county, back at the turn of the century, had about 20,000 people in it. Today, it's about 12,000. So we've seen the migration from the farming community to communities that, where farming is not the main activity anymore. You look here at what's happened. At, at the growth of technology, at the growth of innovation, and the type of people that are the entrepreneurs and like to do things and develop things, and how many times those are the people that have done it, they've stayed in their existing location and made that town successful. Take Bloomington Normal as an example with the Russ family and State Farm started there and it's still there, major employer. It's just by chance that that's where it started. Yeah. When you were uh, growing up in <clears throat> Danville and you were going to high school and you were thinking about college, what about working in finance or, or studying finance interested you? Well, I was going into engineering, but I had a tough time in high school with chemistry and physics. So I decided I better not go into engineering and I better find something else. And I'd always been intrigued with investments. I remember I had a paper route and there was a stockbroker who lived on my route. And he would talk to me often about investing money, the importance of it, and things like that. And it, and it just sort of made me think, this is something I think I'd really enjoy because it's, it's an occupation you can have as a job, but still you get to help people. And I like banking because bankers always seem to be involved in the communities they were in. And that was something I really felt was strong and something I wanted to do, which I was able to do here at Busey. Yeah. That seems though kind of a, a small town notion in the sense that I don't know if you were growing up in Chicago and you got into banking there, you would think so much about banking being about helping people. You know, the institution, even if it still exists, I'm not, the institution of the small town bank certainly would, have, would not have existed there. No, that's very true. And you know, originally I thought I would go to Chicago or New York after I graduated, but as things unfolded, I decided to stay here and I'm, I'm glad I did. And, and I think in the larger cities, there are a few people 
in major corporations that get involved in doing things. But for the masses, that isn't part of your job or what you're expected to do. Yeah. Well, I want to come back to talk a little bit about <clears throat> your experience starting out at the bank. And as you explained, you uh, started working there. You were a sophomore at the U of I, right. part-time teller, dollar twenty-five an hour, part-time janitor, two dollars an hour, so the janitors got paid better. And I think it was nearing the time that you were going to graduate, the bank was getting a computer, and it, it, it was to be the first bank computer in Champaign County. County, right. right. And they looked at you and said, well, son, you go to the University of Illinois. What do you think about these computers? Do you think you could uh, work with them? Well, I told them I don't know anything about computers, but if you train me, I'll try to do my best I can. And it was an exciting time because back then we had what the ILLIAC computer here at the U of I, and, and, and the U of I was noted for computer training, but that was on a massive scale. So they said, we'll train you in programming with IBM, so semester break and summer school, I was either off to Chicago or off to Detroit to learn programming for installing the computer at the bank. And well, we did it second semester of my senior year. Mm -hmm. So what, f as far as the bank was concerned, what did that enable you to do that you couldn't do before? Well, back then it was sort of interesting how automation was so important. And as we look at it today, the, the whole system would have broken down if it hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. But there were new efficiencies in the way checks were processed, checks were recorded, statements were prepared, and things like that. So you went from a sort of a manual system to more of an automated system. Uh, back then, I knew a lot about computers. Uh, people today, especially my kids, say, Dad, you know, you don't know much anymore <laughs> about computers. And I said, that's absolutely right. But there are an awful lot of people today, especially younger people that are into computers, know what they're doing, and have a great opportunity ahead of them. Well, when you, when you started out and uh, were just starting to work with computers and, and getting the training that you got, did you have this sense that you were really getting on the ground floor of something that was going to be really big? Well, I knew that it was something that was important, and I knew it would be a possible career for me. As I got into it, though, I think I had a constant headache when we installed the computer and trying to work with programs and program bugs and, and things like that. But you just, you knew that this was something that was coming. You could sort of feel the tidal wave coming and you had an opportunity to jump on board. And I was glad I did. I was glad that the management of the bank gave me the opportunity to do it back then. So did the other bankers around town, were th did they look at you and say, well, we're not sure that this is good or look at you and say, hey, you guys, this is crazy that you're getting into this, this thing, or, or were they looking at you and saying, we'll see how they do, and then we'll, we'll decide whether we want to do this? I think there was a lot of hesitation, especially where bankers were more conservative. Um, back then, the Clawson family, uh, Jane and Jim Clawson, had controlling interest to the bank. Uh, she had been, her mother was abusive, I think, was the way she got involved. And, and they were very good to me, and they gave me that opportunity. And I think back then, it, it was like looking at technology today. It looks way out, but it's something that's happening. And if you have an opportunity to jump into it, and they're going to pay you to learn it, that's a good deal. Yeah. Well, here, here, here's an example where there was a turning point where maybe your life could have gone one way or another. And, and as you said, you were thinking, well, probably when you graduated, you would have gone to Chicago or New York, look for a job in some big financial institution. And then the bank said, well, we're going to put this computer in and we're looking for people who would be willing to learn how to do it. Would you want to do that? And you said, well, seems like a pretty good idea. And now here all these years later, you're still here. So that's an example of how things can go one way. I do really want to have you tell the story though also about how you met your wife uh, and it, because there certainly is a bank connection. Well there really is. Uh, Carol and I were both in line over at University Ford when University Ford is where the U-Haul place is now over on University Avenue mm -hmm. to get our Mustangs worked on and I was in my car and she was about two cars up in the other line and it looked like it was a pretty nice Mustang so I went up to look at the car and there was this girl sitting in there in curlers. And so we get in the car to go back to work. And I said, I need to go to Busey Bank. And she said, oh, I financed my car at Busey Bank. 
And I said, who'd you work with? And she said, well, the loan officer was Jim Johnson. So when I got back to the bank, I said, Jim, I said, do you remember financing a Mustang for a school teacher? It was really loaded. And she said she financed it with you just recently. And he said, well, I'm pretty sure that was Carol Zimmer. I said, well, give me her phone number. I'm gonna call her up and see if it was Carol Zimmer. So I did. That was on a Monday. Wednesday night, we went out to Steak and Shake for dinner. Uh, two months later, we were engaged, and five months later, we were married. So it's been 46 great years, and Mustangs made it happen. And you just think how, if I hadn't bought a Mustang, if I hadn't had in for service that day, we would have never met. Mm -hmm. So I'm very fortunate that that happened. Carol was born and raised here in Champaign-Urbana, so she liked the community. So as things unfolded, we just stayed here, and we never went to New York or Chicago. So now, tell me the truth. Uh, now, initially, what was it that really caught your eye more? Was it Carol, or was it her Mustang? It was the Mustang. All right. You, there you go. It was the Mustang. <laughs> you couldn't even tell who was sitting in it until you went right up there and you saw this good-looking young woman with hair curlers in her hair. And I thought, I better follow up on this one. Well, we talked about how you, you started at, at Busey as a part-time teller, and that you you did have a, over time a number of positions that you were, you were assistant vice president and then the vice president and then the senior vice president. You became president of Bank of Urbana, which was a Busey subsidiary in 74, 1974. That's correct. And you were 29 years old. Correct. You were the youngest <clears throat> bank president in Champaign-Urbana. Probably in the state of Illinois. Well, they, they may, uh, fair enough, it might certainly be. What was it like moving into that kind of position at that age? Well, you did realize you had nerves, and there were some nervous times. And the idea was I would go out and run that bank for three or four years and then come back to Busey as president. Well, the president of Busey Bank was a great person by the name of Carl Trueblood. He had a heart attack and wanted to slow down. So that's where in 1975 then, he went out to the National Bank of Urbana as president, and I came back to Busey as president. And Carl was actually the person that hired me back in 1964. So he was a great person, a great mentor for me, and, and it, that way he was able to continue working on a reduced basis, and I was able to sort of jump into the big league at Busey. So there you were at Busey, 30 years old, you were the president. There must have been people working, f now working for you, you were their boss, who had been at Busey a long time and who were a lot older than you were. Uh, I think everybody under me was, was older than me. Um, Doug Mills came into the scene in 1971, put together a, a small group to buy out the Clawson family. And Doug had gone to the U of I, was a three sport letter winner, was a great person and Greg, and, and in essence, Doug and I worked together as a team. And then he bought out his partner by bringing some of us in to borrow money to buy the stock. So we had a small group of really a great number of people who had a great time working together for many years building the Busey organization. Mm -hmm. You now, since, uh, since 1975, uh, you have on a regular basis been doing these seminars to talk about the state of the local economy, and you've done them for Champaign-Urbana, and I think also for, for Bloomington Normal. And Peoria. And, and Peoria. Uh, and they're, they have become very, very popular events, very well attended. Uh, people are interested in, uh, in hearing what you have to say and reviewing where things have, have been, where they are, sort of where they're going. So, and you've been now in business here for half a century Champaign-Urbana, Champaign County. I realize this is a big question, but say over those, over those five decades, what do you think are the most important changes that have come about in central Illinois, East Central Illinois? Well, I think probably the biggest change is at the university where economic development became part of their mission statement. Mm -hmm. uh, years ago, I don't think economic development in any way entered into what you were supposed to do if you were at the University of Illinois. And when you add in the technology and the research from the university, and you look at what, what was able to happen and how we were able to expand, that this new arm of the university has created so many job opportunities 
especially in the Champaign County area, but also the surrounding area. The number of people that you see driving in to Champaign-Urbana to work or driving home from cities 10, 15, 20 miles away are quite a few. So I think the growth of the university has been very, very significant. I think the growth as a retail hub has been very significant. When you go to out to Marketplace and you're walking through the parking lot and you look at the stickers on cars to see where they're from, you see them from 40, 50, 60 miles away. So we've become a retail hub for this area. Likewise, you've seen in Bloomington Normal, you've seen strong growth along with the growth of State Farm. So we've been fortunate to have some major employers that have been able to grow over the years and create new opportunities. Yeah. You know, one of the things that um, uh, Champaign-Urbana has been known for, and I'm sure that's the presence of the university is key here, is as a, it has been known as a promising place for the development of high-tech firms. And certainly, it's true, I think that now there are something like 200 high-tech firms. Here we're talking in the summer of 2014, uh, 200 firms, and half of them are in the University Research Park. So certainly there has been a lot of growth. At the same time, you know, when you look back at some of the things people have, have said and talked about, oh, Silicon Prairie, and that we could rival the high-tech areas of, of California, it hasn't quite gotten to, to that point. Are you, do you think we should be satisfied with where we are now with the, with the development of, of high-tech as an industry here in our area? Well, I think the creation of jobs has not been what we thought it would be. However, it's interesting that people were always asking me, Ed, who's building all these new homes? And I went to Dwayne Cole, who was then running the water company and was a friend of mine, and he did a survey one summer of everybody that built a new home, because everybody that built a new home had to have a water meter. And he said, Ed, when you look down at where people are working that are building new homes, it's amazing the number of small companies that are here that we've never heard of. So I think most people don't realize what's going on, that we have a lot of companies, like you said, approximately 200 with 100 of them in the research park, where they might have two or three employees. And a lot of them make it, some of them don't. But that does create job opportunities in the community. When you look at the research park, when you look at 4th Street now going in, and when you look at the land available for research out there, I just hope the development can continue we can, who would have thought 10 years ago you would be attracting name brands like we have at the research park now, like John Deere and Caterpillar and State Farm, and you can just go Abbott Labs, you could go on down the list. So as that grows, and it's gonna grow slowly, it's gonna create more opportunities for the whole community. Well, do you think that initially the, the expectations, people just got a little carried away with what they thought it would, would be, or is there are there some actual factors that tend to slow things down or get in the way of that kind of development? Well, I think there are some challenges. There's challenges in the state of Illinois. Uh, there's challenges on transportation. Um, you know, air transportation is extremely important for everybody, but especially if you're in the high-tech world. You wanna fly in in the morning, do your business and fly out in the evening or afternoon. And we have fairly good air service between here and Chicago but we need air service between other communities also. Hmm. Well, that's, that's something that maybe is a very Champaign-Urbana-centric topic uh, and something that people have been talking about and concerned about a long time, and that is our airport and how it could be developed to, so that there, there's more service there, there are more options. Um, n I'm not sure anybody really has the answer to that, what do you think about that? How, is it really possible for Willard Airport to become a thriving regional airport? Well, I think there's gonna to need to be some changes in the structure and the ownership. Right now it's owned by the university. Mm -hmm. You can look at Bloomington Normal as an example where their airport has a tax on real estate there and they create $3 million a year of income for the airport just by the tax that they have to support the airport, whereas we have zero. So you're looking at a big change in how the airport is possibly owned and how it's run. Right now there's a committee that's headed by Steve Carter and 
fact, you know, Steve was city manager of Champaign for many years. Mm -hmm. He's a great person, a great thinker, and he's chairing the committee now to look into research, look into the development of the airport and how we can expand it. We are just about at the point where we'll, we'll have to stop because you've been very generous with your time. Let me ask you, though, uh, a question, and I'm sure that people ask you this question a lot, and that is, as you look ahead, say, maybe 10 years, maybe even 20 years, what do you think that um, Champaign-Urbana or East Central Illinois will look like, or in, do you think there are ways in which it'll be very different that far in, in the future from where we are now? I don't think it will be a lot different. I think that we'll see continued expansion on a slow basis of the research park at the University of Illinois. I think as we attract more professors who are entrepreneurs, that they will continue expanding that area. But I, if take Bloomington Normal as an example. Uh, if State Farm decides that they're going to reduce their employment level there and expand in Phoenix and other places, that would have a significant impact on the community. Will that happen? We don't know. Mm -hmm. But we're fortunate that we have a balance. You know, you look at ag agriculture. You look at craft here with the expansion they have going on. They're building a building over 18 acres for a addition. So I think we're gonna see what we have now. Hopefully we're gonna see it a little bit larger and we're going to see continuation, but on a slow and steady basis. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure that people uh, <clears throat> think about things that might be done or that we would need, particularly infrastructure that would help. And I'm sure that there are people who say, oh, well, you know, they're, they'd say, it's about transportation, so we need to work on the airport. Or there might be some people who say, oh, what we need is a high-speed high speed rail so people can zip off to Indy, Chicago, or St. Louis. Or, or, you know, they may be concentrating more on quality of life, or they, you know, may be schools, or, you know, whatever it is. Is there anything, is there so one real thing that you could say, well, everything else being equal, if we just worked on this one thing, then we just have explosive growth. You, you just wouldn't believe it. I think there are several areas we could mention, but I think the school systems are extremely important. That with the university, with what the university tries to do, especially through the college education, with the schools, with the public schools, with the private schools, that most people coming into our community are younger, they either have young families or they might be thinking of young families, and the school systems are extremely important. There are probably 10 other things we could mention, but I think schools are so important, education is important. We've got the University of Illinois, we've got Parkland, as you said, in surrounding areas, we have wonderful institutions. But the grade school and the high school has to be top notch. Hmm. That's just one of your competitive arrows that you need to have to be able to sell your community. Well, I, we mentioned uh, more than once, I think I mentioned more than once that you've been at Busey for 50 years. And I think now that you're uh, semi-retired, maybe? I, mean, I call it between being CEO and full retired. So yes, the bank has been very fortunate. Um, I love what I do, Carol loves what she does. Uh, people say, why don't you retire and move to Florida? That's where your families are. And we said, you know, we we just love this community so much, we don't really want to leave it. So I've just been very fortunate to be able to be on a reduced scale, to still have a place to hang my hat, still be able to have employees around me and work with a few customers. And in another 10 years, do you think you'll still be doing it? Well, I've got a feeling another 10 years from now, we'll, we could be in Florida. My brother lives there, my son lives there, our grandsons live there, our other son lives in Miami, one in Fort Myers, works at our bank there. Um, we're not looking forward to any type of change. But I think as you get to a certain point in your life, you need to say, I need people around who are really gonna take care of me <laughs> when I have problems. And I don't think a lot of your close friends are gonna sp spend that much time with you when you have problems, because they're gonna have their own problems. So. We might still be here, 
but if we're not, we'll probably be down in Florida. All right. Well, that's where we'll have to leave it. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it, David. Thank you. I appreciate it. And to you, we say thank you very much for tuning in, and we hope that you will join us again next time for another edition of Illinois Pioneers.